All right, so uh, I think we're about five minutes behind, so I'll try to get caught up. Uh, so uh, like, like I said, for those of you who weren't here early in the morning, I'm, I'm Ray Paik. Uh, up until about uh, seven months ago, I was with the Linux Foundation, uh, involved in a number of projects in addition to chaos. And I made a transition to GitLab. Uh, I started like June 25th. Uh, so, so it was kind of interesting when I made a transition from a foundation-based project to one company-led project. Uh, the way I started looking at metrics obviously has changed. Uh, so I, I mean, although I've only been at the company for seven months, just wanted to share uh, the journey that I went through. And sorry about the long title uh, for my talk. Obviously, <coughs> I'm not going to be hired as an editor for any news, news organizations. Uh, but please feel free to stop me if you have any questions. I won't be offended a bit if I don't go through all of my slides. So, um, so here's my view of my previous community up until June 22nd. Uh, so uh, I started working with fo uh, folks from Viturgia for several years, and this was sort of my view of the world. Uh, and what's Sorry, the fo focus is a bit off, I guess, but hopefully, I mean, the slides are already on the, on, the, uh, on the website, so you can get a better view there, probably. But one of the things that I focused on was the participating organizations that are contributing to a project. And the, uh, sorry, I should have mentioned, it's the project called OPNFE. Uh, this is in the networking space, uh, in case you're not familiar with it. So, um, this isn't even all of the organizations that were actively participating, but we had about a dozen or 15 that were key participants, like you know companies like AT&T, like Ericsson, Huawei, and others. So I, I looked at a lot of the contributions from an organizational perspective rather than like individual developers. I did know a lot of the key developers, obviously, but I really focused on, uh, I mean, things like, I mean, you probably heard the term like the bus factor, right? If, if this project or foundation loses like X number of uh, participating organization, like what's going to happen to the project. Uh, and the other thing that you're, you'll notice is that like a number of repositories, is, it tends to be pretty large uh, for large collaborative projects. Uh, I mean, not all of these projects were active. I mean, there are, there are a lot that I, I was starting to like archive as a community manager uh, when I was at OPNFE, uh, but you have a lot of people you know, making project proposals and, and starting a new, new project within, within a foundation-based project. So you like a huge number of repositories. Uh, so, and this is my dashboard that I use today for GitLab. Uh, obviously, I continue working with, with folks at Vitergia. And what you'll notice here is that like the, all the organizations kind of disappear, right? Like most people that have GitLab IDs, it's associated with their personal email addresses like Gmail. So I have no idea who they work for or are they students or what they do at all. Uh, and then, so I sort of lose that uh, level of granularity. And obviously the number of repository that it goes down significantly. Like if this is all like repos based on our project and obviously we don't want to have like you know, more than, more than a handful of those at GitLab. I mean, what's interesting though was that, I mean, sorry, it's hard to read, like a number of submitters, like if you compare like what we have at GitLab and what we had in OPNFE, the number is actually almost like 2x. And I'll talk about this in a minute, but a lot of these are very casual contributors. They may have done like one or two merge requests like over a period of five years. Uh, but I was like pleasantly surprised at that, like, uh, you know, if you look at like a number of patches and a and, and number of lines of code, uh, usually like the OPNFE was much significantly larger, but we have a lot more casual contributors uh, at GitLab. And I mean, one of the things I should I should point in this out, uh, I mean, GitLab is, is a completely open source. I mean, we have a paid, I mean, there's an enterprise version that you pay for, but even that is like open source and we, we welcome people's contributions. So we, we have like users and, and people that are passionate about Ruby, for example, uh, you know, submit merge requests and then we happily, we happily accept them. And that's one of the things uh, that's been kind of cool about our, our product and our, and our community. Um, so, so our, obviously my view has changed and then, um, uh, and so I'll, I'll 
quickly talk about what's been sort of different, uh, you know, working in two different communities. Um, so the first thing I, I noticed was the contributor's motivation on, on why they're contributing to the project. Uh, for projects like, I mean, Ildiko was here talking about but OpenStack. I mean, there are a number of uh, projects at the Linux Foundation that people are contributing to. But for the most part, people contribute because it's part of their job. I mean, there, there's an expectation that you're spending X percentage of time contributing to OpenStack, as an example. I mean, I don't know how they enforce it, but they, there is a certain level of expectation that you get paid to work at company X because you're, we want you to contribute to these open source projects. So when I was, when I was working at a foundation, this is like a lot of motivation is, is professional, right? It's part of their job, and it's, it, that's the reason why they, they accepted, accepted the offer to work for that company. So a lot of it was very professional. And what I noticed uh, when I came to GitLab, I mean, first, the first challenge I had was I was trying to figure out who these people were. Because, uh, I mean, we have like, hundreds of contributors that are contributing to GitLab, and I had no idea who they were and why they're contributing. Uh, and I had to reach out to these people on an individual basis. So I felt like I was going from a wholesale model to a re like a retail model. I had to like reach out to these people on an individual basis. And the reasons were very varied, but it, it, it was closer to hobby versus work. Uh, I mean, there are certainly a lot of people that were scratching their own itch. Uh, there are people that are using GitLab for work, and then there are certain features they wanted to tweak or new features they wanted to introduce. Uh, so there are a certain number of those people, but there is also a lot of people that were very passionate about Ruby. And they were looking for an open source project where they, they can contribute to. And then one of the things when they did a Google search was that GitLab kind of popped up. And then this is sort of their way of giving back to the Ruby community, which I thought was really interesting. So they were literally doing this after work. Like they're, they're done with their day job, they come home. Uh, and then they're making contribution, whether it's making documentations updates or actually fixing a bug or found a regression. Uh, so it was. It was very eye-opening. Uh, so these were like almost like a hobbyist, like they're doing work uh, and making contributions to uh, to GitLab. So the approach that I had to take with them was was significantly different than than it was like a year ago. So that's one difference. Uh, and the other other uh, difference uh, in in work style that I had to go through was that how I interact with the community members. Uh, so when I was at a foundation, an uh, open source found, uh, you know, based foundation, I met with a lot of people through meetings or like events like this. I, I have developer events like several times a year, and I have a lot of face, I spend a lot of face time with them uh, in a room, you know, on go to meeting or Zoom, and just working with them real time. And what's now different working at a single company-led project is that it's, it's, my interaction is like one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and we, we have uh, at GitLab what we call the core team. So these are like invitation bases. If there are people that have been making significant contributions over time, we invite them to a group called the core team. Uh, and you can go to gitlab.com and do a search there. So we have about like eight people right now. And they made like amazing type of contributions, not just in terms of code. There's one person that's active because he does amazing amount of like a user support on our IRC channel. Like somebody posts a question, I'm trying to like deploy GitLab and I'm stuck here and then Hannes like jumps in. Uh, like unprompted. Like I mean we have like official support channel as well, but he just provides a lot of community support. So we have a core group of people that, you know, a core group of people that we work with, but there are rest of them that I reach out to on an individual basis. I just set up a call, like I found this developer in Russia, uh, in, in this like middle of Russia that I didn't even, uh, wasn't familiar with, but it's like over the last three years, he made like a lot of significant contributions, but this interaction is like one-on-one, -on -one, right? There, he's not in a meeting with me, like with 20 other people. Uh, and the other channel that I really started using, and I was never like active in social media. Uh, I mean, I, the only one that I really use on a daily basis was Twitter, but I was basically a consumer of Twitter content. Like I wasn't posting anything really. Uh, if you look at before like May of last year, the only tweet that I made was something related to soccer. Like that was it. Like, it had nothing to do with work, but that's 
Twitter is another tool that I started using a little bit more actively. I'm not that, uh, uh, I mean, I don't have a whole lot of posts there or anything, but that's a tool that I started using just so that I can like reach out to meet people more effectively. And the other communication mechanism that's gotten that, that's very different is my communication with people is now more like it's almost like 95 percent of the time is asynchronous. It's so I'm not in meetings with them. Like uh, I mean, I'd, a lot of times the developers are in completely different time zone. It was even worse than it w what it was when I was at the Linux Foundation. But I this is something that adjustment that I had to go through. I had to be more comfortable and willing to do asynchronous work with people because. You know, they're all, I mean, literally all over the place, and I had to work with these people like on a one on one basis. Uh, and, and part of it has to do with our company <laughs> culture, too. Like, I mean, we're, GitLab is a 100% virtual organization, and the last count I heard from HR was we have people in 45 different countries. So, there, I can't, sorry about that, I can't expect people to be up because I happen to be up, right, wherever I am. Uh, so, the asynchronous mode of working. I thought I sort of had that like well handled when I was at the Linux Foundation, but I realized I was still like working with people asynchronously, which isn't like a reasonable thing to do. So that's that. All right, so think about halfway through there. I'll kind of try to speed things up. So what do I care about at GitLab with, with the community members that we have? And I threw this like a sales pipeline uh, chart there. Like I don't mean to say I'm trying to grind people up and then spit out money somehow. Um, but I, I brought this, I, I added this slide because I remember like during the early s cycle of my interview process, the question was asked to me uh, in terms of growing a community, have you thought of it in terms of like, a, like a, almost like a sales funnel type of concept? And I kind of tilted my head, like I, I, didn't, I wasn't quite sure where he was getting, going with this, but the more I thought about it during the conversation, it kind of made sense. It's, it's not that different than like a, your typical sales channel. Like you're, you want to raise awareness, I mean you want to convert them to make a first initial purchase and then you want to make them become repeat buyers or repeat contributors. So that wasn't very far off. I, I thought it was kind of an odd question to ask during the interview, but uh, but I try to think about it in, in those terms uh, ever, since, ever since I started working. So obviously things like awareness is important. Uh, and then you probably saw in my first slide, there's a, there's a tagline that says everyone can contribute, but that's sort of been our company tagline for, for several years. And we want, them, we want people to understand that we mean that. Like when people submit a merge request, uh, I mean, merge requests, if you're not familiar, that's basically the same thing as pull requests and get up. Like if pe ma people make a submission, like we, w we want them to, we want people to understand that we're going to treat those like pretty seriously. We don't like disregard those because they came from outside of GitLab, but we want people to understand that that's, you know, we, we that's just, that's more than just a motto. Like we want people to believe it. Uh, so they keep coming back for more and then they become part of our GitLab community. And then the third one is something that, you know, it's probably going to be my focus for the rest of the year is we have a lot of people that are aware and that are starting to contribute, but how do we make them become more regular contributors and how do I do that? I'm not quite sure, but so those are the three things that, that I pay attention to and then I'll just talk about like a different, different metrics that I look at on a day-to-day on a -day basis uh, so that I'm you know, I can keep track of the work I'm doing. Am I making progress or what are some of the other things that I need to work on? Um, so in terms of awareness or making people feel welcome, this is something I tried to do when I was at the Linux Foundation, but there wasn't a really good way of doing it, like in Garrett, because we're using Garrett uh, in the OPNFE community. Uh, how do I like recognize like first time contributors? or make him feel welcome. And then we have a couple of tools that we, we use for that. I mean, there's this little little badge up there next to the merge request. Like it, it highlights that this is person's like first contribution. Uh, and then I also added a label. Uh, we, we also use labels at, at GitLab as well. So I, when I see a contribution that comes in, I also label it as like a first time contributor. Uh, so that I, rec I can recognize that person like immediately and also at, at some point I try to re reach out to like first time contributors on a regular basis so that 
uh, to first, first of all, to thank him and also to con congratulate them for having their patches merge. Um, and so how I do that is, uh, I mean, I basically do a query once a month and say for our last release, I mean, our current release is 11.8. That's going to be released on February 22nd. Uh, I just do a query and say, like, who are the first time contributors for that release? And then it, this makes it easier for me to reach out to them and, and then thank them and appreciate them for their work. Uh, and this is something that I rarely did when I was in OPNFP. I, I thought about doing this, but I didn't have to really prioritize it. Uh, because not, I mean, they didn't have just me to work with, but if, they're, if they came from like Huawei as an example, they have other coaches within the company that can help them out. Uh, so that wasn't something that I really focused on. Uh, but this is something that's pretty important, like on a day-to-day -day basis at, at GitLab. So I could like reach out to them and then make sure that I know who these people are and they can come back for more. Uh, uh, the other one is, are we being responsive to our community members? Uh, so the contribution that comes in uh, through a merge request, uh, if we looked at the identity of the person, and if we know that that's not a GitLab employee, it gets flagged as a community contribution. It just automatically adds a label if that hasn't been done already. Uh, and I want to make sure that that's being responded to and taken care of in a good manner by our employees. And one of the things that people like is like when they have their first merge request merge, they want to know, like, okay, I made this contribution in December. Like, which release was that a part of? I mean, we have a monthly release cycle. It's pretty frequent. Uh, so one of the things I ask our merge request coaches or maintainers to do is make sure that a label is added, uh, which, which is called, like, milestone. And I, I, had, I wanted to, like, use this uh, image because I thought it was, like, really funny. Uh, so there's, we have an engineer named Fatih. Uh, and like he and I had a couple of back and forth because he he would like forget to like put a label on on a on a patch that has been merged. Uh, so this is like my third interaction with Fatih just on the milestone. I said, "Dude, you forgot to add the label," and then he basically apologized and then he just threw that pic. I thought it was like pretty hilarious. I was I was worried that I was being just um, too heavy-handed with people. Uh, on taking care of community contribution, but just show that Fatih has a sense of humor. Um, and then here's another report that I I looked at. Uh, I look at uh, so so medium time to open. Like, is it are things getting merged and reviewed in a reasonable time frame? Uh, so I did a comparison between community contributions and internal uh, development work. Uh, Obviously, like internal work was a lot faster, and I think there are a lot of reasons for that. Like, I mean, our developers, if they've been working at GitLab for a while, they understand the architecture. They don't really have to like rework their their patches. Uh, and community contribution, obviously, it's it's uh, reasonable to think that it's going to take a little longer. I just wanted to make sure that differences were reasonable. And then when I look at the average, like less than four days, that's not bad. I mean, could we do better? Sure. And then there are certain merge requests that doesn't get merged in a reasonable time frame then that we still need to work on. But uh, something that I try to keep an, keep an eye out for and make sure for each release that there isn't a whole lot of fluctuation. Uh, or if there's a fluctuation, hopefully it's for the better. Um, and I'll try to wrap things up really quick. I'm, I guess, still five minutes over. Um, so and this is the last one is, you know, I'm trying to still figure out what I need to do. I'm converting casual contributors to regular contributors. Uh, and then this is an article from last year, I believe, on opensource.com. Uh, but the author basically talks about there are like a five or six important factors that helps you convert casual contributors to more regular contributors. Uh, I thought it was like a really good article. I mean, things like, like the cultural norm of the organization is important. How they feel welcome? Do they identify with the rest of the community members, et cetera, et cetera? Um, so how that gets translated into my day-to-day -day job in GitLab, I I'm still need to figure it, figure this out. But my motivation comes from this data point. I actually shared this with our core team members like last month. Uh, so the point is, like all the way to your right, the others column. But this is basically the number of casual contributors of the history of GitLab. And then uh, George, he's sort of he's one of the top contributors for the past couple of years. He's got 
anywhere between like 200 to 300 uh, MRIs, I think, MRIs, and all the way to the uh, to to your right, next to others, uh, M Has uh, Hasbani, I, I believe is the name. Like that contribution is like less than 20 over the last five years, right? So, you know, because what I told the core team members was that this band here. I'd like this people to be more like 50 people versus like 15 or 20 that we have today. So these are the regular contributors that have been doing more than like five merge requests merge per year. Because uh, I, I kind of pulled that number out of, the, out of the thin air, but the more I think about it, it's not unreasonable. Like people are just doing at least one, well like every other month roughly through, during the year. Uh, so making a regular contribution. So I want to grow that pool to be much larger than what we have today. I don't know what the right target is, but what I like to do is develop a deep bench uh, so that there's a reliable number of contributions that are coming in from outside of the company. Uh, I mean, the main motivation for this, and this is something that I got questions on from the core team members, it's not just to get just more code from outside of GitLab, but their perspective is very important because they're thinking it very differently a lot of times from their user's perspective, not like internal engineer that's getting paid by GitLab. Uh, so it's not just like a free technical work that, that I appreciate, it's the outside perspective is, I think it's just as valuable. So I, the, one of the things that I, I stressed was that I like to get that deeper pool of people making contributions and bringing different perspectives. Uh, and so that's, you know, how I'm gonna do that this year, I, I don't really know. If you have any suggestions or ideas on it, I'd love to hear more, uh, but any, like one or two quick questions before I turn things over to the next speaker. Go ahead. Yeah. Do uh, the casual contributors contribute things that are that are of interest to them, or do they kind of look at? Do you have like a published roadmap that they go through and like uh, look at things? Yeah, I mean, our like so the funny thing about GitLab, like we try to be transparent about everything, and then the problem with that is there's just way too much information. Like I can't even digest like everything that gets published. Uh, but w if you go to our product page, uh, sort of the, what we want to do for the next few releases, that information is all public. And even like our uh, retrospective and when we do a kickoff for the next launch, that all those calls are public. So, I mean, whether people know th where, where to find them, that's a different story. But so the, the plan or a roadmap for our product is, is open. Uh, but in terms of like your original question, uh, I think there are like a couple of different categories. One is like scratching your own itch. Like there are certain features that they didn't like, they wanted to improve it. Once that's done, they, they're done. Like they don't, sometimes, like a lot of times they don't come back. Uh, or there are other things that were, fixes that were like really simple. Like there was a, like a documentation error. And then we love like, you know, like Ildiko saying, it's, we don't think of it as something that's trivial. Like and that's helping QA our work, right? So people make like quick fixes like documentation fixes and then a lot of times they don't, like, for whatever reason, they don't come back. So I think it, it's, it sort of varies. Uh, but, you know, we want to make sure that the contributing experience is good so they come back for more. And then, you know, we want to he hear more, more people's feedback. I'm not sure if I answered your question or the answer around.